Welcome to our continuing discussion of types of structural action. We're going to talk about torsion. There are a couple of general comments we'll make on elements in torsion. First of all, tubular elements work better than any other in terms of resisting uh, torsional influences. And I sections are among the worst. Um, we're going to talk about torsion, and often it's going to be torsion in conjunction with bending because that's a fairly common situation. But there are situations, there can be situations, where we have pure torsion. It's pretty uncommon in architecture, uh, but we find it on the drivetrains of automobiles where a torque is applied to one end of a tube and that tube is rotated and used as part of the drivetrain. But we'll, we'll show an example, at least in a model form. But just to refresh your memory, we've talked about tension. We've talked about compression and the fact that compression elements buckle. And we've talked about bending. So this element started off straight and we applied a force and it bowed like that. So we've done tension, we've done compression, we've done bending, and now we're going to do torsion. And I'll refresh your memory. We have three uh, structural elements here. They're all made out of a quantity of styrene that's basically, uh, let's see, that's uh, six inches wide uh, and it's been cut. So the total linear dimension of that plus that plus that is six inches. The total linear dimension of this is six inches and of course it's all the same thickness which is a sixteenth of an inch and then we've taken that quantity of material and done a whole series of layers of it to do this sort of flat bar and what we see is we have the largest force up here we have by far the smallest force here we have the greatest rotational deformation here uh, less so here and nothing that's detectable at the top. So basically, a tube is working drastically better than an eye section as a torsional element. That's a little frustrating, actually, because uh, it's sometimes hard, especially to roll a square tube into sort of a curvilinear element, and curvilinear elements are typically where we want the tubular section because we'll end up with torsion in those curvilinear elements. We'd love to be able to use the eye section in those situations because it's much easier to roll into a curve, but it's problematical in terms of its performance. So here's one of the most common situations that you'll have. This is a deep truss on the boundary of the building. There's going to be um, brick veneer uh, over this portion of the structure. The bottom cord of this truss is actually a square tube and then welded to the outside of the square tube is an angle which we call a shelf angle. It's sticking out from the building and it's what's going to support the brick. And that brick represents a pretty eccentric load because the brick has to be out far enough that there can be an air gap behind it. In other words, an air gap between it and the truss. And then there will be insulation, rigid insulation there also. So we're several inches of gap between the face of the truss and the inner face of the brick. So that brick is creating a torsional influence on this bottom cord and the bottom cord in this case is rendered as a square tube in order to deal with that. And I apologize for some reason I couldn't get this uh, uh, blow up image to work very well but here we have some square tube on the top and it's not so visible behind this, but there's square tube there. And this is the angle that comes out to support the brick. And then this is an edge of another angle where the brick uh, turns the corner, basically. It's a very common detail now. Even if we don't have a truss, we'll have a deep tubular beam, which can be both the spanning element and the element that's capable of resisting the torsional influence due to the eccentric loading of the brick that's going to go out on this shelf angle. And by the way, this shelf angle not only represents a really oddball structural problem because it's an eccentric load on the structure that's supporting it, but it also represents a huge thermal heat train 
which is one of the issues that we have got to figure out a way to address in uh, masonry facades. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, we have some beam elements that are coming over the top of this element right here. So they come over the top, then they curve around, and then they go back, like so. Um, and these portions are not only in a form of bending, but they're also tending to torque over. In other words, they're tending to create rotation at their ends. And so a round tube has been chosen. It's been chosen because it works pretty well in bending. It works really well in torsion. And also one of the beauties to round tube is you can roll it into a curve like this without buckling the wall. So these tubes actually have been run through rollers and they have a lot of residual stress in them um, because once you run them through and then you release them, uh, there's going to be tension on the material on the inside and compression on the material on the outside. Um, which is the exact opposite of the state of stress that was used to induce this curvature. Um, but understanding the stress condition of these elements is a pretty tricky proposition. Um, it's not your standard uh, structural analysis problem. But this is a really excellent shape. This round uh, profile is also visually quite appealing. So I think they've done this very nicely. This is O'Hare Airport. This shows some details of the support beam. And you'll notice that each of these round tubes that's gone over the top of it has been welded to a kind of structure that then is bolted back here. And that structure is really crucial to keeping this tube from rotating and allowing it to actually function in this torsional mode. This is a little easier to see because this plate basically is a little more uh, visible, but uh, that the welding of this tube to that plate and then the careful bolting of that plate to the structure that's supporting it is crucial to having these things work in torsion the way we want them to. Uh, this just shows some of those members. This is uh, the um, Chicago Metals where they do, they roll huge sections of various kinds. When I was there, I think these were like uh, 10 inch diameter tubes, but you see those sort of U-shaped elements uh, similar to what was used in the O'Hare Airport. Um, this is not architecture, but it's a beautiful example. This is a, a structure where there's a beam-like element underneath, but people will sit out on the edge of the seat and create huge torque on that single element so, so that element has been chosen to serve that function well. So this is a round tube, which has been carefully welded into this coped shape so that that tube cannot rotate. And then the, the chair support has been cantilevered off of that and carefully welded around here so that when somebody sits and puts a force out on the end of this chair, um, this cantilevered system will resist it. You'll notice also this cantilever stops short, but there's a lot of stiffening material and even the seat itself has a kind of taper where it's deeper back near the base. So all this is designed to stop rotation of this chair or this seat from occurring when somebody either sits out on the front of it or throws their body back against the back support. Okay, here's another example. Here we have a beam element that is spanning from there to there. So it has to work as a beam, and we normally, for beam purposes, make it a wide flange. But in this case, we've got elements out at mid-span, which are eccentric. There's actually some material on the other side, but not nearly as much. So most of the load is on this side. It's tending to create a, a tendency for this element to rotate. And as a consequence, this spanning member has been chosen as a tubular member in order to resist that tendency to rotate. So it is working both in bending to support that load out at mid-span, but also in torsion to resist the eccentric nature of the, of the load, which wants to rotate it. Uh, we've seen this one already when we talked about profile shape, but it's another example. 
Here we've got a spanning member across here, which has to work as a beam, but also under wind load, there's a tendency for this portion of the structure to flutter back and forth. And so this uh, torsional capacity is really crucial to keep, the, keep this thing from sort of keeling over in one direction or another. Here's another example, which is really quite beautiful and elegant. This is in Portland. They have a lot of these bus stops which have glass roofs on them, but you'll notice there are two supports here and there. There is a beam along the center line, which by the way can be terminated uh, on one end but not on the other. It's got to have a cantilevered action, so it needs to be a good beam, but it also has the potential for uh, wind effects where you might end up with uplift on one side and a downward force on the other. And these things might set up wind flutter. So it's really crucial that this element be good in torsion. And so it, again, a tube has been chosen for that. And you'll notice the theme here, by the way, these railings, which are also gonna have torsion. So if somebody comes and sits right here, it's not just a uh, cantilevered beam action, but it's a torsional action also tending to twist that. So these handrails are tubular also. This is just another adaptation where there is much more cantilever on one side here and it only cantilevers off to one side relative to these members. So this element has to be beam-like, but it's got to be really sturdy in torsion. And then this element right here is a column but under the eccentric gravity load on this side, it goes into bending, and under wind load on this side, it goes into torsion. So you'll notice the best solution that everybody settles on, whenever you have a significant amount of torsion and bending, especially if the torsion can go in multiple directions, is to just use a tubular, a round tubular element. Here's a bridge. This is in the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco in the Golden Gate Park. And you'll notice there are these snaky bridges that move all the way through it. Those bridges, wherever they come out away from the center of the support, if you have a bunch of people standing here, they're tending to create a torsion, which is tending to rotate that tubular element at the ends. And so the element, uh, again, has been chosen to be tubular because that works well both in bending and in torsion. And down below here, we have an even snakier kind of uh, walkway that has lots of eccentricity between the supports and the torsional action of those elements becomes particularly crucial. Okay, here we have a curved road. Again, if we have a load out here, it is tending to rotate the bridge at that support and at this support. So the bridge comes up and gets wide to grab hold of it at that point and keep it from rotating. But in order for it to work well in rotation, it has to have this tubular quality. And by the way, the tube could have been carried all the way out to there or could have even been carried out to here, but they only needed that much tube and they wanted the edges of this to be perceived as fairly thin, so they brought the edges out in the form of these cantilevered decks. Now, we do have some bridges that we've built in recent years where the, the, all the support is along the center line of the bridge, except uh, at least due to these stays. So these stays are all coming down to the center line, and of course, if you have a lot of traffic on one side, which has been kind of simulated by putting this heavy chain on one side that would represent a, a bunch of, a convoy of trucks or something that have gotten backed up behind an accident. So you could have a lot of load on one side, not much on the other. Um, you'll notice in the case of this model that the student built, there are these elements that go through and help stabilize uh, the thing against rotation at the point of support. So we don't, I don't have any photographs of it, but when you pull these pins out so that you remove that uh, stabilization, this uh, tubular roadbed just immediately rotates around. So it rotates like that and the chain falls off. So that would be what would happen, of course, if you had a convoy of trucks 
they'd all end up down in the abyss because this tubular element would rotate. So it's crucial that this tubular element be stabilized against rotation where it comes through these framing elements. But out in between, it can stabilize itself due to the tubular nature of it. And you'll notice, by the way, there's an I section down the center line of this, which is what's providing a lot of the bending action, but the I section is worthless in torsion. So this tubular shape is really crucial to the way this bridge behaves. And if we look at the next image, if we take that same bridge and we don't, we can make it look tubular and we can give it a tubular shape, but if it doesn't connect along the bottom so that it's a closed tube, then you get a deformation like this. So it's being held by these pins back at the support point, but all kinds of twisting and rotation are taking place out near mid-span because there is no torsional capacity associated with it if it's not a closed tube. You can bring it almost to closure, you can fool people by making it look like a tube, but if it doesn't close on itself, it's not a tube and it does not work in torsion. That concludes our discussion of torsion as a kind of structural action.